Hi, I'm Roger Craver, editor of The Agitator, and it's delightful uh, to be with you, Daryl. Thanks, Roger, and, and I really appreciate uh, you joining us today and, and for our, our viewers and listeners. But, you know, you have one hell of a career, if you don't mind, in fundraising. I'm always impressed, and, and every day I find out more. But just tell us a little bit about how you got into this uh, amazing and crazy profession um, well, it is, it's, it's such a wonderful, uh, gift to, uh, to be able to do this for in life. I, it, it, it really, uh, started with my, uh, my mother who was a social activist in a little town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the civil war fame. And, uh, it was a very conservative area and she, uh, she had little tolerance for the, uh, for the conservative mentality of that place. And it was, a it, it was an area, it's a, it's a huge apple growing area, and uh, there were lots of migrant uh, farm workers, and uh, we lived beside the, uh, the county hospital, and they would not accept uh, migrant workers uh, for medical care, and so every Saturday, my mother and my brother and I would picket the, uh, the hospital, and uh, until they uh, took... Uh, migrant uh, patients, which was, I was in sophomore in college by the time they uh, did that. So it took uh, 15 years to get them to do that. And she also decided to integrate the, uh, the Gettysburg Post Office because the U.S. Postal Service was one of the few uh, employers in the nation at the time that would employ African-Americans. And it was a wonderful way to, uh, to bring African-Americans into the middle class. And uh, there, there weren't many African-Americans in Gettysburg, but she was bound and determined that they were going to work for the U.S. Postal Service. And I remember her one night at dinner saying to my father, Forrest, I expect you on the picket line tomorrow. And he said, Dr. I have a business to run. And I don't think uh, I should uh, be out there doing that. She said, well, Forrest, uh, take it this way. Uh, no picket, no sex. <laughs> and uh, so she, she was a, a big, uh, big influence. So I, I went off to college. I got, uh, got active in the civil rights uh, movement in, in college. And, and when I got out of college, I worked for uh, 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 a fundraising consulting firm doing uh, capital campaigns for small uh, liberal arts schools and decided that that was uh, not what I wanted to do. By that, by that time, the civil rights movement had really heated up and so had the anti uh, Vietnam War movement. So I, uh, I pretty quickly got out of major and capital gift fundraising and went to, went to Washington to, uh, to work on uh, civil rights and also on the uh, war, uh, the efforts to end the war. And it was, um, it was during that, uh, that time in the late 60s that uh, the, uh, I was working for George Washington University, and you couldn't you couldn't raise money in a bank vault on uh, on a university campus because the alumni were pissed off at the faculty. The faculty didn't want anything to do with the students, and the students simply wanted to burn down the place. So, in the in the midst of that, I got a call from uh, John Gardner, who was then the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, who had uh, who had just resigned from the Johnson cabinet because of Johnson's stand on Vietnam. And Gardner wanted to uh, figure out a way to raise lots of money from small gifts. In those days, it just wasn't possible for social change movements to fund themselves unless unions or big foundations or very wealthy individuals put up the money. And, and Gardner wanted nothing to do with that. Uh, so he... Uh, he called me and said, uh, you come talk. And we talked, he said, you know, this has never been done, but I, would, would you, uh, would you consider doing it? And I said, yeah, I, uh, I've never done it. Uh, I don't know how to do it, but, uh, let's, let's figure it out. And, uh, we, uh, it was, it was very interesting. He, uh, I said, do you know anyone in the magazine business? Because I figured it's kind of, kind of getting money for, for ideas. Social change was sort of like selling magazines. And, uh, by me. He happened to be close friends with the chairman of uh, Time Inc., which published Fortune and Time and People and all those magazines. So I went up there. In those days, I had hair down to my <laughs> ass, and uh, I wore a I always wore a, a dungaree shirt, a blue jean shirt with beads. And so I went up to, to the Time uh, in Rockefeller Center, their big 
headquarters. And, and it was, here was uh, the chair of uh, Time and the public and the editors of each of the magazines all sitting around this this glorious maple, uh, huge maple uh, conference table. And uh, I told them what we wanted uh, to do. And I said, can you help? And, and, and in fact, they did. Uh, they said, this is, this is how we would go about it. And they had a young guy by the name of Lester Wonderman who was sitting there. And uh, I, I, he said, I'll, I'll give you a hand on this. And so we went down in the basement of the building and it was, it was there on a piece of chart paper that we figured out how to do this, uh, how to launch this organization called Common Cause uh, in, in August of 1970. And uh, we, we took an ad in the New York Times, full page ad, and put some mail out. And in, uh, in a few months, we had a quarter of a million uh, members who were contributing $15 a year. And that, and, and that set the stage for organizations that uh, that that followed there was right right after that there was a national organization for women there was a public ralph nader's public citizen there was greenpeace there was amnesty and and so i was blessed in that we, i was on the ground floor and many or of these organizations came to common cause and said will you help and so gardner and i were spending so much time helping other organizations that Gardner finally said, Roger, uh, how about you set up a company to do this because we're not going to get anything done here if, uh, if we have to do all this. And, and that's how I got into the consulting or the agency business. It was starting. Uh, so for, for 15 years, all I did was start new, new organizations and, and movements. So it was a it was a wonderful uh, way to, to go from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, picketing uh, the Adams County Hospital to, uh, to working on all these uh, social change movements. Well, your mom certainly put the fire in your belly for social change. Uh, she, sure, <laughs> she, she, sure, she sure did. I, uh, you know, I'm, she, she, lived, she, she lived to be uh, one day short of 100, and... Uh, she uh, she was pissed off at uh, inequality until the day she died. As a matter of fact, we were uh, the night I was with her. I didn't know she was going to die. I just uh, happened to be with her, and she died right after that. We were uh, we were talking about uh, the uh, the idiocy of Donald Trump, and uh, wow. so she, uh, <laughs> she fortunately she uh, she didn't have to witness all that, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so she she was uh, she was terrific. It's amazing that that period from seventy seventy three. If you think about it, Common Cause getting the the template how to raise money, and the I mean MSF Greenpeace, Amnesty was already there, but so many social change organizations formed in that three year period, and bizarrely not just in the U.S. but across the world really. Uh uh, no, ab absolutely, and and there were older like uh, like Amnesty. There were older organizations, or in in the United States, the ACLU, which which then was sixty years old, the Sierra Club, which was fifty years old, they League of Women Voters. These were old, established organizations, but they had very small memberships. Uh, for example, the Sierra Club, when we took them on, had six thousand members, most of them in San Francisco, and. Uh, so the, the, this new technology called direct mail uh, became the uh, became the way to uh, to do this. And 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 in those days, Daryl, there weren't uh, there weren't mailing lists, there weren't uh, there weren't uh, CRMs, <laughs> none, none there well, weren't list brokers, or none of the none of the uh, infrastructure that we have today existed. So I remember uh, sitting in the Library of Congress looking at newsletters. And magazines trying to think, well, if someone would subscribe to this, they might be interested in Common Cause or they might be interested in the National Organization for Women. And we would, we would go uh, door to door with these organizations and say, would you, uh, would you let us use your mailing list and we'll pay, uh, we'll pay you back with, uh, with donors we, uh, we have. And that's how this, uh, this got started. But uh, I mean, there weren't banks to process the uh, returns. The, you know, all this had to be created from... Uh, from the get-go. 
and it and it took a while to get across the pond because I started raising funds for the Sandinistas in the early eighties. And it sounds like we were back in the late 60s, early 70s with you. You know, there were no mailing lists. It was the old hand printer. Absolutely. Uh, ink no, all yeah. over your hands, you're stuffing envelopes and uh, yes. and yeah. trying to think, who do you reach? And in fact, you know, just as you used a newspaper, both for that and for the Mandela campaigns I've worked with, you know, in the end, it was a full page advert in The Guardian paid by individuals to get it up there. And then yeah. you built the list. We couldn't buy. You know, where do you find a list of revolutionary people? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's not available. No. Exactly. And I, 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 I mean, there weren't there weren't uh, uh, services like Prism or Claritas or yeah. all the uh, demographic things. So I, I remember uh, going to an early Common Cause meeting in Connecticut, and I uh, went out in the parking lot. In those days, I smoked to have a cigarette. And I noticed there were just an uh, unusual number of Volvos. So I thought, well, you know, I wonder if I would write Volvo owners, whether that was so. I went to the Maryland uh, Registry of Motor Vehicles and got a Volvo list. And sure enough, uh, that uh, that worked. So that was my first experience with, uh, <laughs> with, with demographics. Uh, the uh, it just you had to figure it out because they're they're just you couldn't yeah. pick up the phone and say send me a million uh, uh, liberal uh, donor names and today you can do that but uh, well within within a certain range yeah I mean for example it's funny now I guess you'll be looking at the Toyota Prius owners would you probably yeah yeah not, no, not exactly exa no exactly and uh, and today you'd also be, of course uh, catalogs where well, there were some catalogs there was a strange. A strange project, uh, process, uh, process called Kozak Auto Dry Wash. It was a rag, a piece of cloth that people used to clean their cars. And that turned out to be one of the best mailing lists I, I, for the life of me. Uh, and, you know, you, you just as you as you do this stuff, you learn that you 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 can't always use logic and reason. Oh. To, uh, to understand what uh, what moves people to give and what type of people will give. It's funny, isn't it? And I think now the kind of creativity and the, the kind of inventing it and reinventing it, and I'd say to begin with testing it or trying it, and then later, as you develop very much so, testing versus trying was really in its nascency at that right, point. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the commercial, uh, the commercial world didn't do a lot of uh, of testing, uh, and and where uh, the the reason that uh, that uh, work with Lester Wonderman, who went on to to build Wonderman worldwide, the, the largest of the direct response uh, agencies, time uh, or twenty years later, uh, was that the, the 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 most sophisticated direct mail people in those days were the book clubs. Yeah, book of the month, uh, which he did. Columbia, Columbia Records. They they had continuity programs, which are like our sustainer programs uh, now, and uh, or you, what you call regular giving in uh, in Europe. And, uh, so we learned a, learned a lot from the commercial world, and as a matter of fact, our sector can still learn a lot from the commercial world because they spend they spend so much uh, money and have so much discipline when it comes to. Uh, comes to trying uh, things and monitoring uh, the returns and, and being very scientific about it. Yeah. Well, you were right there at the, the basement, as you mentioned earlier, of the setting up a fundraising for Greenpeace. And when I joined in 93, which is more or less the time we got to meet each other the first time around that mid nineties, I remember Volley, Gerhard Wallmeier from Germany, who I'm sure you recall, he's the founder of Greenpeace oh, absolutely, Germany, absolutely. set a huge DM program. But he was obsessed with we don't, as a nonprofit sector, look enough at the commercial center, sector and looking at even how people read things with their eyeballs, where they move, even gender specific texts that can make a difference. And I'm sure you've come across many of those in your in your time that make a difference. <laughs> oh, it does, and that's one. Of the, yeah, one of the reasons. I mean, most of my most of my career has been uh, as a copywriter into into strategy. But in the last ten years, I've been I've been spending a lot of time on and and with our newsletter, the Agitator. I spend a lot of time uh, on behavioral science and uh, the, the 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 evidentiary part of uh, of human behavior because that's that's where you can affect some real serious. Uh, change and, and improve things. I mean, you know, so much of our, 
so much of our trade is uh, is based on uh, sort of word of mouth, like I call them old wives tales. And some some of the conventional wisdom is is good. Some of it uh, some of it isn't. Uh, and uh, I, I keep uh, I keep reminding people we need a <clears throat> we need to move from what I call eminence based that is the famous consultants uh, to evidence based uh, fundraising because there's uh, there is an awful lot of bullshit uh, that floats around out there and uh, it needs to be uh, needs to be uh, challenged by uh, by more empirical information well it's great to hear one of the eminence grease talking about evidence <laughs> <laughs> yeah the more you know just like you Daryl, the more you stay in this business the, yeah. the, the the more you know you don't know yeah uh, exactly. and that's that's the and then it becomes really important to be disciplined in this stuff because it, it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher to uh, uh to raise money for nonprofits because they're one, there are fewer. There, there are really fewer donors, but there are also competing channels for for people to get involved, whether it's uh, through corporate uh, responsibility stuff or or whether it's through the point of sale at a supermarket and add, add add that round up your uh, your total to give to a charity. That I mean, there's so much uh, so much noise and different channels out there now that it's really important to understand what uh, what, what donors. But you, you were in right at the beginning of the digital. I mean, we, telephone, we call skip that because, you know, you're there at the beginning of that. But you were there at the very beginning of the digital stage. And, and uh, you know, I recall when, when you were telling me back in the day how you just built a website for Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF. And now we've moved into the whole area of social digital. And I have suddenly the sense all of that learning from testing, trying, is being learned some of it algorithmically in the digital social sphere and and what's your thoughts about that are they are they sort of picking up the the baton and now running with that learning because there's a hell of a lot of data you can pull on the digital side well i think one of the uh, the the answer is not as much as it should be the um there, there is there is a sort of laziness that uh, lets the algorithms of the Facebooks and others uh, do do the do so much of the work, and and there's very very little uh, work uh, or effort put into the content of of this stuff. And and one one of my um, I guess worries is that there's so there's so many people into digital. Who don't, uh, who really don't have a grounding in the basic principles of, uh, of marketing uh, and, and motivation. And if they, if they would take the time to learn what's been learned over the last 75 years, it would, it would work so much better. I mean, here in the United States, uh, although, although digital has been on the rise and markedly on the rise because of the pandemic, it still only accounts for. 11% of the total amount of money raised in the United States. And so it, uh, you know, there's this, there's this misunderstanding on the part of folks that digital is free, uh, that you can just blast this stuff out there uh, and, and it'll all work. And that's not the case. As a matter of fact, there's ample, ample evidence that the more you blast it out, the more you hurt retention rates and, and other things. So there, there needs to be far more discipline uh, taken from, from previous generations of channels, uh, whether it's uh, mail or telemarketing or face-to-face -face and used in, uh, in the digital realm. But I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated, not least because, you know, as an owner, co-owner of a digital channel, but I'm fascinated even by the names of the folks we have on the teams. We have more people employed as storytellers than any of the nonprofits we probably work for. And I think, wow, that is now embedded in the culture, real storytelling. People have to tell human engaging stories for the causes on a regular basis. And my God, how many years did it take for organizations to get that into their minds? Oh, and, and, and uh, it's, most organizations still don't do it. Yeah. Uh, it, it which is really, uh, really tragic because we, we do know that uh, it, is, it is stories that uh, that make the world a difference in uh, in in building human relationships and, and fundraising is is nothing more 
than a, than a human relationship. And uh, if it's done right, and and the storytelling becomes uh, becomes very very important. Yet so many organizations continue to insist on this organization centric uh, messaging of we have. We have 20 uh, branches, or we uh, we have 18 PhDs, or whatever the yeah. whatever the reason. Yeah. No, it's amazing. We both had a little chat earlier and, and yesterday about our good friend, no longer with us, George Smith, and I was chatting with Ken Burnett, another one of our colleagues. Yeah, Ken kicked off with relationship fundraising. George wrote the preeminent book on on copywriting that that sold. You've written retention fundraising, and yet I have to tell fundraisers who are actually in quite senior levels, go back and read some of the books. And and I know yeah. that's a pet cause of yours about people don't read the stuff. Well, it is. I, I mean, maybe I get a little carried away with it, but I spend three hours a day reading. And a lot of it is some of the old classics from advertising. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in 1923, uh, a guy by the name of Claude Hopkins published a book called Scientific Advertising, and it still, it still has some of the, the really great principles uh, that, of human motivation that have been proven over the years by scientific method now. I mean, far more scientific than when he, when he did it. But uh, yeah, the old, the old classics, particularly the direct mail classics, are so important because they, they tested everything. And it was a direct, direct mail and advertising was always a stepchild. It, it, never, it, it never became very important until the late 70s, early 80s. And, and uh, it was always put down. The only, the only major advertising guy that uh, thought the world of, of direct mail was David Ogilvy. Yeah. And uh, he, he always uh, uh, accorded it a pretty pretty high place but there's a lot known about this stuff and yeah. and folks folks really should uh, uh should dig in and read so i i you know i have kind of a joke that 50 uh, percent of the people in fundraising are able to read and about five percent do so. <laughs> well well yeah we've mentioned retention fundraising and obviously there's the agitator and donor voice where else would you recommend uh in the in the current source of information that people go to you know dr adrian Sargent, for example is somebody i admire greatly because him and jen chang do real research on this stuff and and publish and who would you recommend right. that people go to now as well, people wanting to up their game well i would i would recommend that, that adrian and jen stuff be read i'd recommend that people read the donor voice stuff in the agitator because we do report on a lot of research that we conduct uh, for digital, there's a there's a, a site called Next After uh, that that is the only site I know that maintains a testing bible for digital um, activity, and it um, it's it's very valuable because they deal with uh, with issues like conversion rates and and uh, length of copy and and frequency of messaging and every everything you would deal with in direct mail uh or direct response anything they uh they test and report the results publicly so that's a that's a very uh that's a very good source and then it, it's it's always good to look at organizations that that do this stuff uh well and 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 by by that I mean organizations who spend a lot of time and effort on donor care on on uh, communicating with their donors. It's a it's it's probably the best way to to learn this and to see how other people do it. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of organizations that do it uh, regularly because uh, sadly most most CEOs or, or CFOs and some fundraisers consider donor care a uh, cost center, and in fact, it's an enormous profit center. Yeah. But that's uh, that's the uh, the issue. I I do I do think that reading uh, reading Ken's uh, uh, relationship fundraising and uh, my retention book would would give you a pretty good grounding on the on the theory and the science of this uh, on this stuff and and. Uh, I, I just think we're reading uh, generally, staying in touch with the blogs and looking for blogs that have data uh, is, is simply valuable. 
Yeah, I know my next reading is next after after this call. I'm gonna straight yeah. away go and try to find no, it because I wasn't familiar with that one. So that's that's new to me, and I'll make sure we link to it in this article. Good, good. Well, Roger, I've taken some of your time this afternoon. It's always a pleasure to talk, and I could go on and. It would be even better if one of those days we could be sitting there with a glass of wine and, and <laughs> <laughs> celebrating the life and revolution together. But uh, yeah, well, you know, it's really, it, uh, I, you know, you, you'd like to, you'd like to think that uh, some of the stuff that we've accomplished, Daryl, stays uh, stays stuck, but it doesn't. Uh, it, you know, the one, the one thing I've learned in this. Uh, in this world is that the victories never stay won. You got to be back. And now, you know, we're, we're, um, no matter what field you're, you're in, uh, we're, we're, we're up to our asses and huddled masses. We're up to our ass in, in government trouble. We're just, uh, you know, all this stuff has to be, uh, refought and the skills, the skill sets we need to do it now are much greater. So it's, yeah. uh, this is, this is really a time when, when, uh, fundraisers have to have to dig in and learn as much as they can. I don't, I don't mean to be preachy on that, but I, you know, I know how much effort you've put in over the years and how much others have that have made social change. And it isn't, uh, it isn't enough to say, well, this is what I did. I'm, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, hang up the spurs. Uh, you don't hang up the spurs. Uh, you keep, keep riding until the horse drops. As they say in Spanish, la lucha continua. <laughs> the fight continues. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. May Pleasure. you continue to agitate. And uh, I really, and really you, appreciate your time. You as well. My pleasure, Darren.